For generations, one of the central stories of American identity has been that diversity is our strength. That story is openly challenged now by those who see America's changing demographics as a threat. Today's guest uses storytelling to celebrate diversity and challenge those who would dismiss its value. He's Teya Arboleda, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square began as an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. Each week, we sit down with storytellers and analysts whose work shines a light on the narrative shaping American public life. This week, we're joined by a talented storyteller and educator who specializes in stories about diversity. Teya Arboleda, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, uh, you're a diversity educator. Yes, I am. And filmmaker. Yes, I am. How, first of all, tell us what a diversity educator is, and tell us how you use, use a lot of different media, not just film. Tell us about the work that you do. Well, uh, the word diversity is fairly new in our education market, uh, multiculturalism, inclusiveness. Uh, in the 90s, uh, when I was working in television, I had tried to figure out a way to teach issues of culture and race in an entertaining way. So as a diversity educator, I'm not just someone who you know stands up in front of a room and talks about how we should all hug and kiss. Although hugging and kiss is fine. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, as an entertainer, I wanted to figure out a way to do that in a way that's engaging. Uh, and interactive. Uh, so as a diversity educator uh, and as a college professor, I, te I do teach issues of race and culture uh, in the classroom, but I also create programs that are entertaining and exciting. So uh, we're going to talk about some of those programs in a little bit. Um, tell us how you got into this, into this line of work, though, because you are an entertainer, you are an educator. Tell us how the, the genesis of, of, of your career. Sure. I was uh, the... Uh, uh, editor at Frontline, uh, PBS, uh, back in the 90s. And I went to see Al Franken, the former Senator Al Franken, speak at Harvard uh, basically about how to write and produce comedy about politics. About 450 people in the audience. And after he spoke, I asked him a simple question. I said, well, you know, Mr. Franken, what, what do you want to do to diversify uh, your your cast and your writers on your show? And he made some racist and sexist and homophobic comments. And after I sat down, he kept making pretty negative remarks. And uh, he kept calling me the ethnic guy. He kept making these remarks and pointing at me and saying, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, ethnic man, ethnic guy. So I turned to my wife and I said, all right, I'm leaving. I'm leaving PBS. I'm going to do something. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I just got this guy. So. I started my company, Entertaining Diversity, and I spent about a year trying to figure out what's the best way to engage young people in uh, figuring out who they are in the context of race and culture and, I, and, and religion and sexuality and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I wrote a play, uh, My Kind, which became Ethnic Man, based on uh, Al Franken's uh, <laughs> moment there. And uh, Ethnic An A Man became my stage name, and I performed that one-man show probably about a thousand times around the US. Wow, wow. that's amazing. Yeah. But your work then and now has been clearly informed by your childhood. Tell our audience your background and... and sure. Well, I'm still going through that childhood. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, as you know, just before the show started. Um, I, uh, so my father is um, African-American, Native American, Filipino, Chinese. And my mother is German Danish. My mother was born in northern Germany. My father was born in Georgia, in Atlanta, uh, during segregation, uh, Jim Crow. Uh, his father, Filipino, uh, moved the family to the Philippines when my father was about nine. So my father grew up in the Philippines, became a Filipino uh, person, culturally speaking. 
Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I grew up in Germany first and then Japan for 14 years. So I spent most of my years until I was 19 in Japan. So I consider myself Japanese culturally speaking, although I don't I look stereotypically uh, Japanese. So as a multiracial, multicultural, and multi-ethnic person, uh, and being a TCK kid, which means a uh, third culture kid, which means that kids who live in different countries mm -hmm. and sort of are never quite home, uh, I kn there was no place for me really in the context and the landscape of college at the time. They had no clubs for people like me. Uh, so I had to figure out uh, on my own, and as a producer and as an entertainer, uh, I never quite fit in. You know, if I, as an actor, I don't, I'm not quite black, not quite white, not quite Asian, uh, although I look Hispanic and they want to play a thug, uh, and I don't like to play stereotypical roles, so I pretty much didn't do a lot in that, in, in that respect. So I had to create something on my own. I had to create situations in which I could really uh, persevere and I could, I could, uh, um, make statements and, and tell stories that are relevant to hundreds of millions of people in, 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 uh, around the world. One of your interests is what you describe as authenticity of story. Talk about that. What do you mean by that? And, and how do you bring that message to oh, your Oh, sure, audience? yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, it's a very, that's a very touchy subject because authenticity uh, is important when you're telling a story. If it's not authentic, people won't know. You know, you can smell, smell that from a mile away, right, if a story is not true. Um, when it comes to culture, it's very tricky because culture is not necessarily how you look. So, for example, if I were to go to an audition for, uh, let's say they're casting an Asian person, I would go to the audition because I consider myself Asian in one respect. But I don't look stereotypically Asian. So the person they would choose to play an Asian person, culturally speaking, would be someone who looks Asian, not necessarily someone who grew up in Asia. So they may maybe hire a person who looks Japanese, but speaks no word of Japanese, and I'm fluent in Japanese. So authenticity in, in terms of culture is really about who you are. So if you take a look at media, for example, uh, we, know that, we know that Pocahontas was not a you know, makeup wearing, gorgeous Hollywood, you know, who fell in love with this guy, John, uh, she was raped, mm -hmm. you know, and so the authenticity of the story of Pocahontas should be taught in schools, right? So what, are we going to teach the true story to kids about what happened to Pocahontas? Well, we should, but we don't, you know, we all we gloss over that. Um, authenticity when it comes to our cultural experience is also very important because, for example, I, I know that, um, uh, you know, let's, um, uh, um, Oscar's so white, the hashtag Oscar's so white. Mm -hmm. So the la last two years are the, you know, whitest two years in Oscar's history. Uh, it's, we know yesterday that that's changed uh, considerably. Authenticity in that respect is very important because whitewashing, you know, Scarlett Johansson playing a Japanese person, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. Right. You know, uh, you know, uh, it's so, um, but that becomes an issue for people like myself and, over two billion other people who could easily represent uh, from an acting standpoint as well, from a directing standpoint, from a writing standpoint, authenticity is important because if you don't know the story, you can't tell the story. If you don't know the story, you can't tell the story. You actually have no right to tell the story uh, unless you, you, you pull some of that from people who actually do know the story. What, what, so I'm curious what you think about um the challenge of educating uh, someone. So you, your personal biography is fascinating, and the you you you've lived a diverse experience in different cultures, and you just your own uh, personal uh, background. How do you educate someone who is white, upper middle class? You know, who has not had a diverse uh, educational experience? Uh, maybe came, comes from an affluent, overwhelmingly white. Uh, neighborhood, uh, how, how do you begin to uh, uh, evoke the, the understanding of what other is and that it's not necessarily bad? Well, sure. Okay, so um, where I started with in the 90s, it was really a response to the idea that diversity in multicultural education was a matter of race, race studies. Mm -hmm. It was called black studies at the time, back in the 70s. And that's to say that it's a very binary, I, very binary concept, very bi binary. Uh, you're either black or you're white. Right, exactly. And so forget everybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have so many other kinds of people, if you will. Diversity is really a much larger landscape of hum the human experience. And not only that, it's, a, it's the layering of the, la uh, the landscape of the human experience. So for example, you could be black, Jewish, and gay. 
I have two friends who are black, Jewish, and gay, right? Uh, and so, so do they identify with being black? Yes. Gay? Yes. Jewish? Yes. But, it, but you're placed into a box, right? So, it, but for for white people as well, it's it's not just that you're 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 white, and of course there are many different kinds of white, as mm -hmm. there are different kinds of Asian or Hispanic or black or Native American. It's that your experiences tell a story. My mother's from Northern Germany. My mother is, I mean, I use my, my, my mom's uh, uh, um, uh, story often because it's very important. Northern Germany, born in the middle of, uh, of the war, ne nearly you know, decimated her whole area. Most people in her building were taken away. Um, but she's white. She's a white German. So her experiences having lived through the war with you know, extreme poverty, uh, that's a story. Mm -hmm. the, the diversity of, of uh, class is uh, becoming a much bigger issue in this country. We don't talk about that. We don't want to talk about that at the dinner table. Mm -mm. But the experiences of you and your ancestors are as important as someone who's just down the street who happens to be a very different color. It's just what, in what respect, what layer is, is giving you the idea that you are different from, from someone else. So why do you think we don't, and I think you're right, talk about class much in America today? Well, it's scary. We don't talk about religion either, but it's scary to talk about class because the truth of the matter is that we're, you know, the, the, the division between the wealthy and the poor is growing significantly. Uh, and, uh, and even if the economy is doing a little bit better today, it doesn't mean that there are hundreds of millions of people who are really suffering. Uh, class is difficult to talk about because we have no control over it. You do have control over your story. You can say, the, this is where I come from. These are the experiences I've had. Um, uh, and, I, and I've actually been homeless. And this is an another part of the story that, that is not talked about. I didn't talk about the fact that I was uh, homeless uh, for four, four months you know, in the streets of Boston and Cambridge. Um, I know poverty. And also, when we were kids, we were very, very poor. Um, but I didn't talk about it because it's embarrassing. To me, at the time when I was younger, it was embarrassing. Now, now I, look, I look back and, I, th and I, th I know that the experiences that I've had negative helped me become a stronger person. Um, but we don't like to talk about it because you know, it makes us feel like we may have more than other people. And you know, w what are you going to give up? What are you going to give up to really help out the person you know, living next to you? There are a lot of, uh, uh, let's call them interesting forces at work right now in American society around the issues of diversity. You engage on a regular basis with your performances and your, and your, and your teaching with a young generation of uh, Americans. What's the kind of response you get? Well, so I started this work in 1992. Uh, this was around the Rodney King Era. This was around the LA riots era. era. This was this was at a period of time when there were there was gang-based warfare, uh, race-based gang warfare in major cities around the country. You know, not just the Crips and the Bloods in LA, but this was every Chicago, Boston, New York, uh, Miami, and 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 this was all a, a, a result of what we're seeing today too. Is the is the ubiquitousness of media that is propagated simply by an iPhone or at the time, a, a, you know, a high eight camera. Um, the, the, challenge, the challenge has always been, and I don't have no idea what your question was, so I'm just going <laughs> to... The, the, chal the challenge has always been to figure out a way to talk about it and get people to talk about it in a way that um, makes them feel safe. And that safe space can only be obtained when we see that we all have some kind of difference within us, and you know whatever that is, and some kind of shortcoming. Uh, that opens up that a little bit uh, if we know that the other person has also experienced some pain. Uh, I did a program in upstate New York maybe 15 years ago, maybe 500 people so in the audience. And after the program, I said, you know, has anyone here never felt like an outsider? And only one person raised his hand. And I said, well, now you do. <laughs> because it's true that you know, we all, all of us, you know, if we close our eyes and we think about a moment in our childhood where we felt like we were bullied for whatever reason, too short, too tall, you know, uh, missing teeth, whatever it is, um, we all have pain. 
We need to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. You can listen to an audio version of this program three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS Channel 124. And you can hear us anytime on the Sirius XM app. Story in the Public Square is produced by a talented team of professionals at Rhode Island PBS and we're lucky to work with them. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to catch up with me on Twitter, and I hope you will, I'm at J.M. Lutis. To my right is my co-host, G. Wayne Miller, an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and the author of, at last count, 17 books. He's tweeting to at G. Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week, Taya Arboleda, is an Emmy award-winning filmmaker and diversity educator. You can connect with him on Twitter at Tea Arboleda. I'm going to spell that. It's T E J A A R B O L E D A. Tea, uh, you know, we, I had the benefit of meeting you a few years ago when you came down to Salve Regina for a couple of events. Uh, and anybody who has sat in the audience and knows that part of your appeal is just your. Uh, skill your ability as a performer. So uh, let's listen briefly to a clip from one of your shows. My father's mother was African American, Native American. And my father's father was Filipino Chinese. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I grew up in Japan. And that's why they call me Ethnic Man. Yes! So how did you uh, develop the stage presence? The kitchen. In your, in, <laughs> growing up as a kid? <laughs> uh, singing, singing for your supper? <laughs> With a fork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, so my, my wife is a, is a director. And uh, when I wrote this particular play, uh, which originally was called My Kind, it was uh, then renamed to Ethnic Man. Um, we tried to figure out a way to do this as a one-person show, a one-man show. And uh, the stage presence comes from years of having done uh, uh, theater and television in Japan in the United States. I did comedy in Japan. I did some comedy in the States. Did, in Japanese you did uh, comedy yeah. in Japan? Mm -hmm. and, uh, wow. and TV commercials here in the States back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so, I mean, I love being in front of the camera. Have, have there, you been? there are three here today. <laughs> <laughs> have you, well, we actually have a whole lot more on the yeah, side, too. Even so better. You're, surra <laughs> you're surrounded by cameras. Have you been back to Japan oh, yeah. recently? My dad and my brother still live there. They do? Yeah, they do. That's very cool. Yeah. So you do a lot of work on uh, campuses. Yes. Have you become involved or interested in the free speech movement? Has that ever come up? You know, we've had a number of notable incidents, uh, instances, rather, at schools where conservative writers or, or authors or whatever show up and they get shouted down and it becomes sort of an ugly thing. Do you, what are your thoughts on Yeah, there, there's a national tour show that I do called Crossing the Line, Comedians, Politicians, and Shock Jocks. And what I do over the course of an hour is I break down uh, uh, a series of uh, videos that are taken from online or from television and we critique them with respect to race, culture, gender, poverty, things like that. And so they're section by section, and the audience votes on what's funny and what's not funny, or what's, what's offensive and not offensive. And that all shows up aggregated on the screen behind me uh, uh, as a poll. And they use their smartphones for that. And so what's happened over the years, I've been doing this for a few years now, is, um, is you know, just like we did with, um, with, with, with You've Crossed the Line, you had the aggregated polls on the, on yeah. the screen, is, is that we get a good sense live of what an audience thinks anonymously about what's right or wrong in terms of what we're saying about people. So, for example, Chris Rock uses the N-word like every sentence, several times a sentence, right? Is it okay for him to use the N-word because he's black or because he's a comedian or both? Then what if you're half black, like me? Can, can I say the N-word or not? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm a comedian or if uh, I'm you know, on stage or if I'm half black, if I'm white, so uh, Michael Richards from Seinfeld, he was booed off the stage because he used the N-word. Um, you know, there, there, are different, there are many different scenarios where the N-word might be used. The question is, as a comedian, if you have to cross the line, where's that line? Do, would Chris Rock use the N-word when he's sitting across the table from former President Obama? 
Probably not. Probably not. And Obama is half white and half black like me. Can he use the N-word? So it, it's, re, it's, it's a very, very touchy thing. It's very important college campuses for the students to feel like they have a chance to voice their opinion about things like freedom of speech, the, the First Amendment. And you know what's happened the last year has been fascinating. Fascinating that college campuses are ablaze with curiosity about what is OK and what's not OK. Uh, my personal take is that it's never OK to, to use the N-word. Um, but that's just my personal opinion, right? I mean, it is, it is a right, so to speak. But where's that line? It's very curious about where we are today. You know, there's a, um, so there's a, there, there, there's a, a long tradition, a, a mythology in America that, uh, you know, e pluribus unum from any one or a nation of immigrants, uh, that diversity is our strength. There are voices now pushing back, and they are, I would call them white supremacists, but they say, no, diversity is not our strength. Uh, how do you confront those kinds of voices that are, uh, you know, from my perspective, operating from a place of real ignorance and, and hate? Sure. How do you confront them? Well, you, you know the phrase, uh, the melting pot. Yeah. So the melting pot was created back when iron was king. You know, when they were, when they had these huge smelting machines, and they, they would dump a different iron ores and metals into, and they would cauldron, and they would, they would, you know, it would be heated up to the point where it became a metal that they could use to build ships and skyscrapers. Um, the idea, of the, the the word melting pot is to suggest that we're all one, right? Mm -hmm. But that happened at a time when it was mostly white Europeans immigrating to the United States. Right. I don't know if that word would have been used if people from Haiti and South America and Africa would have been immigrating to the States in the same numbers comparatively as, uh, as white Europeans were immigrating here. So the, the question is, um, are we really all one? Well, no. Is diversity our strength? Yes. Um, but diversity also is a very contentious idea mm -hmm. because once we have a diversity of opinion, we don't have a solid argument for something. And if you have a group of people sitting around a room at a, in a boardroom making a decision about something, all from one perspective, you're probably not going to get the best solution if you're looking to sell products to a diverse audience. So knowing where people come from, as I mentioned earlier, knowing the authenticity of the story is very important. You can't market products to a, uh, a group of people, of 350 million people or so, uh, because we are diverse. White, male, Christian, straight is the minority in this country today. So if you are a white, Christian, male, straight, and you run a major corporation, and you have no interest in understanding where people come from in different cultural backgrounds, then you're going to miss the mark by a huge degree. So, so economic and market forces, you think, will, will bring some change uh, at those high levels? Is that what you're? Ultimately, yes, but there's a lot of kickback. You can see it in Hollywood, yeah. Hollywood today. You know, you've got, you've got people, and you've got A-list actors who take the roles of minority actors because they can. You have, you have people telling stories about the Native American culture who know nothing about the Native American culture, who are telling those stories and getting Oscars. You have people who are in major corporations who are selling to groups of people who don't understand, and they're missing the mark. And, the, and what happens is that young people don't care as much anymore about what someone looks like as people my age. I'm 55. You know, my daughter is 14. She has friends who are uh, every possible uh, imaginable background, right? Doesn't talk about it, doesn't say so and so who is this or who is that. Doesn't say it's not I have no idea. Yeah. It's not an issue for her yeah. at all. Well, it's not and, even something and, she's and thinking about. We want to mention quickly a couple of your books, Mixed Feelings for Preteens and Jenny So Many, a picture book for little kids that both focus on uh, mixed identity. Sure. Yeah. So to tell us a little bit about the books. We've got about uh, two minutes. Sure. Uh, the second fastest growing household population in the United States is the mixed race family. That means that there are millions in, in 20 years that will be 40 percent mixed race and mixed cultural families will be 40 percent of U.S. households. Mixed Feelings is a book for preteens. It's on how to help them understand better how to navigate uh, uh, um, 
race and culture in the context of what we call sort of the, the, the binary system, you know, black, white, Asian, and such. Um, mixed race kids are vulnerable in many respects because they are identified as being mixed all the time. Are you this? Are you that? Are you in? Are you out? What are you exactly? Tell me where you come from. And it's and it's there's a lot of bullying. Uh, and our former president uh, can attest to that as well, having grown up in Indonesia and being mixed race. Um, Jenny so many is for little kids. Uh, it's not about race specifically. It's about different identities in one. Mm -hmm. And Jenny is an animal who's a mix of different animals. And she learns how to make friends with animals who represent parts of her. And she finds a way to connect in that regard. Fascinating. You're an educator, you teach at Clark University. Do you think the educational system, and this is a very broad question and we're giving you about 30 seconds to answer, do you think the educational system is failing or has failed our young people in terms of telling and teaching authentic stories and civics and values? We'll give you a minute. Sure. <laughs> he's a generous guy. <laughs> I don't know how he's doing it. But. You know, I, I, I was just thinking about this also in the hallway before I came in. I, you know, I, STEM is really important. It's ultimately very important. I still don't understand why we can't move to the metric system. STEM is important. Why not? And it's, it, 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 it's an allegory, really. It, it, and, and that is that diversity should be infused in many respects, in English, in history, and different perspectives of history. So for example, if we teach history, if you're gonna teach, uh, you know, Columbus discovered America, which, bizarre, but every year it's apparently done so, and I didn't grow up here, but it's done so, at least tell the other side of the story. Why not? Why not have a chapter that is equal in length to Columbus story about the Native Americans' perspective and have a group of Native American nations tell that story. And you have that there and have multiple perspectives. Bring the Chinese Exclusionary Act into the story. Bring all these other stories in and then students can learn not just about history, but they can learn about the authenticity of history from different perspectives. And wh that would make kids so much more able to give them tools to see the world as being a lot more interesting than just a box. We need to leave it there, but it's a great topic. Taya Arboleda, thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or you can visit us at PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up on previous episodes. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We hope you'll join us again next week for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>